The title of today's talk is Behavior Therapy for Children with Tourette Syndrome. We'll do a few different things. We'll start by describing Tourette Syndrome, what it is, uh, and some of its uh, characteristics. And then we'll go into a, a behavioral model for Tourette's, talking about what, you know, why we would use behavior therapy, giving you some background research about the effects of contextual factors on tick expression. And then we'll describe the treatment that we use and present some evidence for its use before its efficacy. So the, the primary symptom of Tourette's is tick, a tick, or ticks. Uh, and a tick is a sudden, rapid, recurrent, non-rhythmic, stereotyped motor movement or vocalization. Uh, there, uh, there's a distinction, at least made in the literature, between vocal ticks and motor ticks. It's unclear whether or not the distinction is meaningful because vocal ticks always involve motor movement. So it's it's not sure, it's not clear whether there's actually a, a utility in, in differentiating between vocal and motor ticks. Ticks are neurologically based. They're not learned. It's, it's clearly a result of neurological uh, deficits. Uh, but learning can have a profound impact. In other words, the effect of the context, the, infect, the effect of the environment can have a profound impact on the expression of the ticks, how frequently or how intensely they occur. Ticks are involuntary. Uh, the people who have ticks, it's not a choice. They don't, they don't want to have ticks. They don't choose to do ticks. However, unlike a lot of movement disorders, ticks can be suppressed for a brief period of time. Uh, people can notice that they're coming and can hold them back, uh, much like you can hold back a sneeze, for example, if you, if you notice a sneeze is coming. They can do this because they're able to recognize a, a core phenomenological feature of Tourette syndrome, which is this thing called a premonitory urge. A premonitory urge is a sensation that builds up in the body, either in the area specific to the tick or a more, more general feeling throughout the body. The urge is experienced sometimes as a tension, a tickle, a tingle, a pressure, uh, and, and it it's builds up before the tick occurs and then is often released after the tick happens. And then you end up creating a cycle where the urge builds, the tick alleviates it, the t urge builds, the tick alleviates it. Now the ticks, uh, motor and vocal are one type of distinction between the, the types of ticks, and then there's al they're also differentiated between simple and complex ticks. Simple ticks are very discrete, one-off motor movements or vocalizations or sounds. So example of uh, simple motor ticks include things like eye blinking or eye darting. Those are common ticks, especially at the beginning. Shoulder shrugging, mouth movements, head jerks, those kinds of things. Very simple, very fast, discrete units of movement that really don't look very intentional, frankly. Um, simple vocal ticks are sounds that people make. Uh, that don't really have any uh, meaning or form, so to speak. So it's <clears throat> throat clearing, sniffing, <clears throat> things like that would be a vocal tick, a simple vocal tick. Often these are uh, confused for allergies at the beginning. Eye ticks are often confused for visual problems. And so a lot of times by the time people get diagnosed with ticks, They've been to the eye doctor to make sure that the, it's not an eye problem They've because of the eye blinking or the eye rolling. They've been to the allergist because of the sniffing or the throat clearing to make sure it's not some type of allergy. Complex ticks are either sequences of simple ticks that always occur in a fixed pattern or they're uh, behaviors that look much more intentional. Okay? Often these are confused with OCD, uh, for example. Sometimes they're confused with stereotypies. Um, stereotypic movement disorder. Complex motor tics include things like touching, squatting, jumping, uh, evening up, tapping, you know, which a lot of people see that and they think automatically that's OCD. It's not necessarily OCD. Okay? Um, sometimes it is OCD, but sometimes it's just Tourette's. Uh, in complex vocal tics uh, are usually words or phrases that people say. This is where we, we hear about the swearing tick, the a symptom we call coprolalia, uh, which is actually a very, very rare symptom, even though in the literature and out in the public, public, uh, like public literature and out in the public media, you'd think coprolalia was the defining symptom of Tourette's, the swearing symptom, and it's really not. It's actually a fairly rare symptom within the cluster. Uh, complex vocal tics, again, words, phrases. To have a diagnosis of Tourette syndrome, and, and, and it's actually not called Tourette syndrome in the DSM, it's called Tourette disorder, 
uh, you have to have the following symptom presentation. You have to have at least two motor tics and one vocal tic that have been present for at least 12 months without a tic-free period of more than three months. Right. Uh, you used to have to have impairment caused by the tics. So you couldn't get the, before dsm 4 tr if you didn't have impairment that was caused by the tics, you couldn't have a diagnosis of Tourette disorder. And dsm 4 tr that, that was removed, actually. You, you, the impairment criteria is gone. If you have the tics, you have the disorder. Uh, Tourette's is really just one of a spectrum of, of tic disorders, uh, it, it, although the spectrum may not really be meaningful in terms of the distinctions between them. You have transient tic disorder, which means you have motor and or vocal tics that have been present for uh, at least four weeks, but less than uh, 12 months. Then you have chronic tic disorder, which is motor or vocal tics, but not both, that have been present for at least a year. Then you have Tourette disorder, and then you have tic disorder NOS as well. Tourette disorder often gets parents very nervous, and I think part of the reason that that name makes people very nervous when they hear, oh, you, your child has Tourette's, as opposed to your child just has tics, uh, is because there's, there's been a misportrayal of what the disorder actually is. Uh, first of all, what you see in the media is that it's the swearing thing. Everybody's completely out of control. That's actually a, a fairly rare exception, like I said. Um, the second thing is, a lot of people think that Tourette's means more than tics. And it really doesn't. I mean, diagnostically, it's tics, two motor and a vocal for more than a year. The, the issue is that Tourette's often comes along with a lot of other problems. It doesn't have to, but it often does. And so a lot of people assume that Tourette's is more than just tics. So what are the common problems that come with Tourette's? Well, a big one is OCD. Uh, there are estimates that say up to 60% of people with Tourette's, uh, Tourette's also have a comorbid OCD diagnosis. I think that's probably too high, uh, but I would say 60% might have OCD or symptoms that make people think they have OCD, even if they don't, which is a pretty important distinction. Um, ADHD is probably the most common comorbidity, so people with Tourette's tend to have a much, much greater likelihood of having ADHD. Uh, some estimates suggest 50 to 90 percent of people with Tourette's have ADHD. Again, I think the 90 percent is a way big overestimation. I think 50 percent might be your top end, maybe 60 percent, um, but I think that's, that's probably even high um, when you look at the community-based sample of people with Tourette's. Other, disorder, other clusters that have higher prevalence rates in Tourette's, anxiety, uh, there are higher prevalence rates of anxiety disorders in Tourette's, higher rates of depression, although not extraordinarily higher uh, than the general population. Um, disruptive behavior, which tend to, tends to go along with uh, ADHD. And an important feature that, that's been discussed, although there's not really been a lot of great research on it, is this concept of rage attacks. In people with Tourette's, you, you hear, um, reported maybe 20 to 30 percent of the cases, you'll hear reported, reports of what are called rage attacks, which are these extreme outbursts of anger that are provoked by very small uh, episodes. Uh, so a child is told no on something fairly small and they explode. And, the, and then not just they're, they're stomping off somewhere, but that they're punching a hole in a wall and, and it's really an extreme attack of anger. Um, now, whether that's actually just a regular disruptive behavior disorder or whether that's something specific to tics, nobody actually knows. It does seem to respond to parent management training that you can bring that kind of stuff down um, with, with restructuring of environment. Um, but that's been discussed as a potential uh, extra symptom cluster in people with Tourette's. Now, there are other, not just disorders, but generally people with Tourette's can tend to be a little bit more anxious there can be mood issues, there can be impulsive, just generally impulsive behavior, even if it's not at a disordered level, and there can be problems with learning. Uh, reading and math disabilities in particular become problems, and writing disabilities or writing problems actually show up as well. It's not necessarily because of poor coordination, although that can happen too, but some of the co complex tics will involve repetitive rewriting and so on. Tourette starts in young children, usually starts between the ages of four and six. It's much more common in boys, four or five, six to one. Uh, starts with motor tics usually, then vocal tics develop later. The first tics to usually emerge are eye blinking, eye rolling tics, tics of the face, 
uh, and then the ticks develop in a head down direction. Almost everybody with Tourette's has a history of having facial ticks, and then about 60% will have ticks that actually develop below the waist, stomping your foot, tensing your feet, something like that. Ticks usually start simple and then complex. If a person shows up with complex ticks and they have no history of simple ticks, then it's probably not Tourette syndrome. That would be one of the things I'd be thinking. Um, I would be thinking that if the, a complex tick alone showed up, it might be something more like OCD, it might be a stereotypy, it might be Sydenham's chorea, it might be something else, but it, it might not be Tourette's at that point. The peak severity, the disorder develops at the age of four to six. It increases between the age of 10 to 13, roughly, is when it peaks in severity. Uh, and then about a third will diminish their ticks into adulthood to the point where they're almost gone. Another third will continue to, to go on, uh, but the ticks might get a lot less noticeable uh, and, and not be interfering at all with the, family, with the patient into adulthood. And then another third will continue their severity into adulthood, if not uh, grow even more severe as they grow into adults. The symptoms uh, in this disorder wax and wane over time. So throughout the course of the disorder, the symptoms will get more severe and then less severe and then more severe and then less severe. Uh, sometimes it, it goes seasonally. You know, summers might get a little better, winters get a little worse, you know, those kinds of things. And in addition to the general waxing and waning of the severity, you also get the start of new symptoms, the, the going away of old symptoms, so the symptoms themselves are changing frequently. Usually people with Tourette's will have a couple ticks that sort of stick around for a long time, like the, the core ticks, and then other symptoms will just kind of come and go, but even the core ticks can disappear and, 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 and new ones can be coming back. Um, comorbid conditions usually develop after the onset of ticks, with the exception of ADHD. ADHD tends to show up first. And ticks are typically treated when they're treated. They're not always treated. If the ticks aren't impairing, they're generally not treated. Uh, but uh, when the ticks are treated, they're typically treated with medication. Usually clonidine and guanfacine are the first two medications that are tried uh, because their side effect profiles are relatively uh, safe. And uh, they have <clears throat> a little added benefit in that they can help improve attentional functioning. And so that, and since ADHD often goes with Tourette's, they, those medications are often started first. If those medications don't work, then what we would typically do is, if you're going to go a medication route, would be to try something like Risperdal, um, Geodon, uh, the atypical antipsychotics. If those don't work, then it would be something like a traditional antipsychotic like Haloperidol. Obviously, as you escalate up that chain, your side effects get worse, uh, and compliance with the medication regimen gets worse as well. There are new treatments that are out there medically, uh, deep brain stimulation, uh, which, which is a surgical procedure that involves putting electrodes into the basal ganglia and trying to regulate the, the, the neural firing uh, through sort of like a pacemaker device. There's not much evidence on this in children. The evidence in adults suggests it could be promising, but there are a lot of problems with it in terms of the science right now. They don't exactly know where to put the leads. It's sort of been hit or miss. So if you would... If you would look at all the studies that have been done uh, where they've put the, the electrodes in the brain on deep brain stimulation, if you had a picture of the basal ganglia, it kind of looks like somebody threw darts at it uh, when you look at all the targets. Um, and, and However, it may not matter. I mean, it depends. Uh, but what, what has um, what the data do suggest that it could be potentially useful for some people. We don't know about the long-term side effects of that procedure yet, though. And then another procedure that's really started to, to take off um, in some areas is Botox injections into the area of the, of the body where the, where the tick actually occurs, which does seem to be somewhat effective for some people. Now, one of the key features of the syndrome of, of Tourette's is that the symptoms are heavily and predictably influenced by the surroundings. So the environmental circumstances, the context that the person is in, really pushes and pulls the ticks. Certain ticks, a person with Tourette sees a certain uh, thing, they might respond with a vocal tick in a certain way. They see somebody do a movement, it might trigger a movement in them. If somebody starts reacting to their ticks in a certain way, their ticks might increase. They start doing certain activities, their ticks will increase or decrease. So if you ask anybody who ever works with kids with Tourette's, they know this. They know exactly what, what I mean when I say that the symptoms are heavily influenced by the surroundings uh, because it, it's very obvious when you start to look at it. Now that's really important uh, because that information, unfortunately, hasn't been used very often clinically to help the kids who have Tourette's. 
uh, it's always recognized, but no, nobody's ever really done anything with that, that, uh, that observation. So that's really the basis for the rest of this talk, which is let's explore how the environment, how the context influences the symptoms, and then let's talk about how we can modify that environment to reduce the symptoms. The core problem in Tourette's is a, a brain dysfunction. It's a genetic disorder. There's no, no doubt about that. It comes down through family lines, although the exact mode of transmission isn't clear. Um, but the core problem is uh, essentially a dysfunction of inhibition, at least that's the current belief, uh, of motoric inhibition at the level of the basal ganglia. All right. The basal ganglia is a sub, uh, subcortical structure that involves the suppression of movement, at least that's one of the jobs, suppression of movement signals. Right? So various movement signals, whenever we have to do something, come down from the cortex, they go into the basal ganglia, certain signals are suppressed, certain signals are allowed to go through, and what depends on what's allowed to go through is related to the context that the person's in, the, the situation that they're in. Certain movements are appropriate for certain situations, certain movements aren't appropriate. Now, when I'm talking about selecting, I don't mean like we're thinking, oh, this is good, this is bad, I should let this through, I shouldn't let this through. This isn't happening at the level of conscious awareness, this is just happening, all right? It's, it's stuff, stuff we're not aware of. So the signals come down, certain signals get stopped, certain signals go through in the basal ganglia. Okay, especially in the area called the striatum, which is the area that seems to be really impaired in people with Tourette's. The signals that are allowed to go through eventually get coordinated and executed as movements. The signals that aren't allowed to go through get stopped. Right? Now the, and that's like the, the brain's braking system. Think about it that way. The problem in Tourette's is that the brakes don't work very well. The brakes slip a little bit. And so in Tourette's, the, the uh, certain volume, uh, volume of the striatum is a little smaller in people with Tourette's. The, the neurochemical that's involved in the transmission through the striatum isn't, is, isn't acting like it should. And so the braking system doesn't work as well as it should. Okay. So that seems to be what actually leads to the tics. Now it's important to understand that the, once the tics get out in the environment, the environment starts acting on the, on the brain uh, as a function of being in front of the tics or being exposed to the tics. Now remember, the brain itself is an adaptive organ. Its job is to adapt to the environment. Its job is to change in reaction to the environment. And so the tics happen into the environment, they happen into the world, and then the world's going to react to the tics. The world's going to laugh at the tics, the world's going to ignore the tics, the world's going to you know, turn your head and stare at the tics, the world's going to do whatever it does. That's happening outside the, the person with tics, and it's also happening inside the person with tics. The person with tics might feel better after they tick. They might feel a little relief after they tick. So that happens after the tick happens. Now, as the tics start to change the environment, the environment will start to react on the tics. So as the environment changes, the tics will change as well. Now, obviously, any of this happens through the brain. Uh, the brain is being changed as a function of this tick environment relationship. Okay. Why would we look for these tick environment relationships? It's simple. If we can understand how environmental antecedents and consequences impact ticks, then we can uh, modify the environment in a targeted way to promote tick reduction. We're going to spend a little bit more time talking about this. When we talk about antecedents, we're talking about things that happen before the ticks that make the ticks more or less likely to happen. When we're talking about consequences, we're talking about things that happen right after a tick occurs that make the ticks more or less likely to happen in the future in those situations where the consequence was delivered. So what are some examples of antecedents that can make ticks worse or better? Places, situations, other people, just being around certain people make people's ticks worse or sometimes better. Activities, one activity may make ticks flare up, other activities may decrease ticks. Uh, internal experiences, that urge feeling that people have right before they do the tick is an example of an antecedent. When present, when the urge is present, the tick is more likely to happen. When the urge isn't there, the tick won't occur. So those factors can influence the, the tick expression. Consequences, we talk about positive reinforcement, uh, things like reactions to ticks that people have could make ticks worse than they need to be, or negative reinforcement, allowing people to get out of unpleasant activities because of ticks for example, can make ticks worse than they need to be. So what are some examples of antecedent events that have impacted ticks? 
Well, there was a study done by Silva et al. in 95 that looked at, surveyed people with Tourette's and asked them, Does, do these different events, and they had a list of different events, do these different events make your tics better, worse, or not change your tics? It, tell us what you think. And people with Tourette's, a lot of them said being upset or anxious, they felt made their tics worse. Some felt that it didn't really make their tics any different, and some felt that it actually improved their tics. Some people felt that watching television made their t t tics much worse. Uh, some people felt that watching television actually helped their tics, and other people felt that it didn't change their tics at all. Being alone, some got better, some got worse, some didn't change. Social gatherings, some got better, some got worse, some didn't change. Now, I'm going to argue that this was a really important study, but it doesn't sound very important. And why is that? Well, it sounds like, oh, well, you're just saying everybody's different. So what? But that's exactly the point. The point is that everybody's going to be impacted by their environment. Their tics are going to be impacted by their environment in different ways, but in very reliable ways. These people were able to say, yes, this makes my tics worse, and I know it does. And this makes my tics better, and I know it does. I feel confident to say that. Yet everybody's reporting different ways of that happening. So there, there, there's some pretty important data embedded in there that this neurological condition is reliably pushed around by environmental circumstances. That, that's important. Stressful life events. Um, and, and when I say stressful life events, we're talking about acute stressors to, to life, not just my, my life sucks and, and therefore I'm going to have more ticks. It's not that. It's just like specific stressors in life can make ticks worse. Uh, hearing others cough can make it, make it happen worse. Talking about ticks can make it worse. We did a study where we, and I've actually seen a study that's replicated this now, where when you have the content of conversation being focused on ticks, the ticks will flare up relative to when you're not talking about ticks, but just still engaging with the person, which tells you just the, the, the content of what you're discussing can influence the, the symptoms themselves. And that's, that's pretty important to think about, especially when you're considering diagnosing severity of a kid and you're talking about their tics and you're seeing their tics spike. It might be worthwhile to consider that they may not be as severe as, as you're seeing right in front of you. Um, what about consequence events that can impact tics? Well, we know tics can be made more frequent from consequences or less frequent from consequences. Unfortunately, the data on being made more frequent from consequences isn't as strong as the data for being made less frequent from consequences. So what are the consequences that can make tics more frequent? There was a study by Watson and Sterling looking at social reactions. And in this one, they showed that a, a parent's attention to the tics uh, in the form of scolding, begging the child to stop, those kinds of things, actually made a child's tics worse. And when those attention variables were removed from the child's environment, the child's tics greatly decreased. So what they did is they found this child who was doing a lot of tics, especially a vocal tic, especially at the dinner table, that's where it was worse. And they went in and they did a functional assessment. And what they realized as they were observing this was that the parents were attending quite frequently to the child's tics as they were happening at the dinner table. So child would <coughs> kind of tick, and the parents would say, stop it, quit, quiet, that kind of thing, pretty much constantly. Watson and Sterling went in and they said, okay, do something different. We want you to, every 15 seconds she goes without a tick, say something to her, talk to her. You know, normal dinner conversation, praise her, tell her good job, whatever it might be, attend to her at that point. When she's ticking, ignore her. And within days, the, the tick decreased greatly. Now, it didn't completely eliminate, and you wouldn't necessarily expect it to eliminate because the underlying biology, biological problem is still there. But what you've done in this case is kind of scrape off the effects of the environment and left the biology for itself. And so that's, that's really one of the interesting things about that Watson and Sterling paper. And it's very common that you'll see parents, especially during a big burst of ticks, parents will attend to the child, ask the child if they're okay, comfort the child, so on and so forth. And it's normal good parenting stuff, but uh, it can potentially reinforce the ticks and make them worse than they need to be. Peer attention, you know, children who do ticks in school irritate the teacher, that can be a source of attention for the child. Uh, they can be in some sort of way popular sometimes when that, when that occurs. And so that could potentially be uh, reinforcing the ticks. Escape from an aversive situation. Imagine a child sitting in a classroom uh, being asked to read 
and the child has to read out loud. They start ticking very loudly. While they're reading, the child starts getting embarrassed. The teacher starts feeling bad for the child, and the teacher says, you know what, why don't you just close your book, go out to the nurse's office, get your ticks out, relax, and come back when you feel better. And that's actually what teachers are instructed to do. That's a lot of popular press, how to help teachers' books with, you know, with dealing with kids with Tourette's, give that exact example. Um, and most of that's okay. Letting the child go to a room where they feel safe, letting them, you know, if, if, where they're not embarrassing or disrupting the other kids, that's actually not a bad idea. The bad part of that example was putting the book down, you don't have to do the work anymore. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the part that's not so good. You know, what a better response would be, you know, I can see you're struggling right now. Why don't you go out with the teacher's aid, go to the nurse's office, and you can read, read there. That'd be wonderful. Okay. And so we, we have to be careful that escape from these aversive situations can actually be making the ticks worse than, than they possibly need to be. Another factor that can make the ticks worse than they need to be is this reduction of the premonitory urge. So we talked about this urge building up. Well, what people with Tourette's report frequently is that the urge builds up, they tick, and it's relief. You know, they experience relief. And so that creates this cycle of feel uncomfortable, tick, relief. Feel uncomfortable, tick, relief. Which we all know if we understand behavioral psychology that this is just a negative reinforcement cycle that can make the tick stronger than it needs to be. It strengthens the tick. So that, that could be another factor that make ticks worse, makes ticks worse than they need to be. Ticks can also be made less frequent uh, by consequences. So we talk about reinforcing suppression of ticks. Remember, ticks can be suppressed voluntarily for a short period of time, uh, which the behavior of suppression is just that, it's behavior. So we should be able to, to reinforce that behavior. We should be able to strengthen that behavior. In the natural environment, what are reinforcers? What are, what's the payoff for suppressing your ticks? Well, it's avoiding being teased. Nobody comments on, on your ticks when you suppress them. You are able to do things that you used to not be able to do, like social activities or sports. I've worked with a lot of kids who can't go to movie theaters anymore, and they haven't gone in five years because their vocal ticks are too loud, and they want nothing more than just to be normal and go sit with their friends sitting in a movie theater. And what's the payoff if they can suppress? Well, they can go see Spider-Man or something like that. That's actually more powerful than a lot of things to a kid. Uh, they avoid being embarrassed. That's a big one. They can ask the girl out that they've been sitting next to for, for three years in class if they can start bringing those ticks down. Now, they can do it with the ticks too, but a lot of times they feel too embarrassed to do that. Yeah. And then a big factor that I want to talk about is, again, reminding you of this negative reinforcement hypothesis. This is a factor that makes ticks worse, because this is a key one. And the reason it's so key is that it's here all the time. It's always present. The urge is internal. The, the relief from the urge is internal when the tick happens. So I want, you, I want to hit on this one again. In this, this negative reinforcement hypothesis, the urge builds up, the tick happens, and then we get relief. Right? That negative reinforcement cycle just makes the tick stronger and stronger. I want to take some time now to talk about some of the research we've been doing in our lab to look at the effects of the environment. These are actually quick studies. I won't spend a ton of time on each one of these, but talk about some of the studies we've done in our lab to look at the effects of the environment on tick expression and how consequences to ticks actually can move ticks around in very reliable and predictable ways. So we're going to do five, five studies. A lot of these use single subject experimental methodology. Uh, they're meant to be demonstration cases. They're not to be meant to be exhaustive tests of, of the hypothesis, but just to show that the theory has some legs. Um, study one asks the question of whether reinforcing tick suppression can actually create tick reduction. So is what I just said possible? Can you actually, in the lab, create tick reduction through reinforcing suppression behavior? Two, is it actually the reinforcement that creates the reduction, or is it some other process? Three, can stimulus control over ticks develop? And four, what effect does stress have on ticks? Because there's a big belief about stress in ticks. And then five, what is the actual evidence for this negative reinforcement hypothesis? So almost, well, all of these studies actually start with this thing. People come into my lab, uh, children with Tourette's come into my lab. They're in a little three meter by three meter room and they are sat in front of this box. This box they're told is a tick detector. It's not a tick detector. 
but they think it is. The tick detector is an old operant uh, token dispenser chamber from the 60s, roughly. Actually, I called Med Associates and had to dig out some plans to build one of these again. They haven't built one for a while, so um, they still had their plans, I guess. This old operant token dispenser with an internet camera mounted on top to give the illusion that it can actually watch the child. Um, and the child is told that this has motion sensors in it and the computer that is running it has been programmed to detect just their ticks. Okay? Now, it doesn't do any of that. The, the motion detector is one of my undergrad RAs who's sitting behind the mirror with you know, a clipboard and cap plungers and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's not as, as high tech as it would sound. The children are told that the tick detector will always be watching them throughout these studies. They will always be counting their ticks. Sometimes it will do other things, and we'll talk about what, it's, what other things it might do during, the, during each study. One of the things it will do in some parts of the study is to deliver tokens out here, and the tokens are worth money. The first study asked the question, can reinforcing tick suppression create tick reduction? We had four children with Tourette's. They had three different conditions that they were exposed to. The first condition was baseline. And in baseline, the children were brought into the room and they were told to tick freely. Don't try to stop. The tick detector's watching you. Just sit there. Be yourself. And we, let, we left the room. In the next condition, they were told to try what, do whatever they could to stop their ticks. They were given verbal instructions to suppress. Much like a parent saying, stop it. Or a teacher saying, stop it. You know, don't, don't have any ticks now. We're going to church. Don't embarrass us. That kind of thing. It was, it was that model. They told, were told that the tick detector was watching them, but they should just try to stop their ticks. The third condition was the, what we call DRO, differential reinforcement of zero rate behavior. Essentially what this condition was, was they were told to stop their ticks in whatever way they could, and they were told that for every 10 seconds they went without a tick, they would get a token. The tick detector would deliver a token. And the token would be worth a few cents at the end of the study. The more tokens they had, the more money they got. Now, actually, everybody got 2 or $3 at the end of the study. It didn't matter how well they suppressed. Everybody got paid the same. But the illusion was that they, the more they suppressed, the, the more money they got. And then we went back to the verbal instructions, and then we went back to reinforced suppression. The first child, Billy, is in the gray bar here. Billy at baseline was ticking about 50% of the 10 second intervals. When we, he was asked to suppress but not reinforce, his ticks dropped to 40%. When he was uh, reinforced for suppressing, his ticks dropped to 10%. When, he, when we took the reinforcement away but asked him to st keep suppressing, his ticks went back up to about 40%. When we reinforced suppression again, his ticks went down to 8%. Lewis, baseline 70%, Asked him to suppress, he stayed at 70%, even though he said he was trying to stop them. We put, turned the reinforcement back on, his ticks disappeared. Turned the reinforcement off, but asked him to suppress. His, oh, this is Nick, sorry. His ticks uh, uh, reemerged to about 60%, turned the reinforcement on, his ticks disappeared. Nick showed a very similar pattern. Mary also showed a different pattern, the same pattern. She was just on a different uh, dependent variable metric. We did frequency instead of percent interval because of the nature of our ticks. But essentially what we showed here is that when we added reinforcement to a request to suppress, we saw a 76% reduction in, in uh, symptoms. When we just asked them to suppress, we saw a 10% reduction in symptoms. So there seems to be something about reinforcement that brings the, the behavior down further. Now, the first time I presented this study, in fact, you'll hear almost all of these studies I'm going to talk about are end with the story of the first time I presented this study, somebody asked this question. And then you'll see another study that answers the question that, because that's kind of how I build my research career. I wait for people to ask me an interesting question, and then I do the study. So um, after I did this study, somebody said, yeah, but how do you know it's really a reinforcement that's doing it? Maybe just getting the token makes them pay more attention to it. You know, like they focus more on it because there's a token coming out. They focus more on the, on the task. And that's actually a really interesting question. You know, is it really the reinforcement process or is it more of an attentional process? Because depending on which way it is, makes you think you might do different things. So we did another study to ask the question, is it really reinforcement? Or is it some other process that's creating this reduction? And in this study, we did an alternating treatments design. Sometimes it's called a multi-element design. An alternating treatments design comparing three conditions um, in these subjects. 
four children. Uh, we had the three conditions were reinforced suppression. So try to stop your ticks. Every 10 seconds you go without a tick, the tick detector gives you a token. A baseline condition, don't try to, don't try to stop your ticks, let them happen. No, no reinforcement. And then another condition where we said, we want you to stop your ticks, do whatever you can to stop your ticks. You're going to get tokens. The tokens are reminders to let you, re to remind you to keep stopping your ticks. All right. Now the difference between that and the reinforced suppression condition was that the tokens in the non-contingent condition, that second condition, actually had nothing to do with how well they were suppressing. They were delivered randomly. Actually, not quite randomly. They were delivered in a, in a way that was yoked to the reinforced condition temporally. But in any case, they didn't have anything to do with how well the children were actually suppressing. The tokens were worth just as much, but the, the tokens had nothing to do with how well they were suppressing. And we replicated each condition two to three times, and each condition was five minutes in length. So this is what we found. These are a little bit tricky to read, so you kind of have to let your eyes, but once you rest on it, but once you see it, you'll understand. The baseline are the green triangles. So each, each green triangle is one of the five minute baseline conditions. The yellow is the non-contingent reward. So remember in this condition, they were asked to suppress their ticks. They were given tokens during the condition. They were told the tokens were reminders that they should suppress. And they were given just as many tokens in this condition as they were the reinforced suppression condition, all right? And then the red diamonds are the contingent suppression. This is when they were asked to suppress, they were reinforced for suppressing, and the reinforcers were, were actually tied to how well they suppressed. All right? So this one tells, this child tells you pretty clearly that the reinforcement mattered. It, it was the contingent relationship between the behavior of suppression and the reward that actually brought the behavior down. Uh, because when they were asked to suppress here and reminded to do it frequently through the delivery of tokens, they didn't really show any suppression effect, all right? He didn't. Second subject, same effect, really. Uh, contingent suppression was lower than the other two. There was a little separation. The non-contingent suppression was actually generally lower than the, the baseline, so there was some effect of just telling this child to suppress and delivering reminders, but the real reduction came when the contingency was delivered in a contingent fashion, when the reward was delivered in a contingent fashion. Subject three showed essentially the same effect. Non-contingent reward with instructions to suppress really didn't produce much of an effect. The only real effect happened when the reward was delivered contingently. All right. The fourth subject actually showed no effect of suppression, so nothing worked for this child. So what does that tell us? That tells us that it's not, just, it's not just a reminder, it's not just a prompt to keep suppressing that keeps people active. It actually has something to do with the contingency. The, the, the delivery of a reinforcer contingent on effective suppression behavior is actually what makes that suppression behavior strong. It's not just reminding, it's not just providing instructions. Now, if that's true, which I'm pretty convinced it is, but if it's true, then by extension, other things should happen. So if, if you have a rat, for example, and you put a rat in front of a box, and you put it never been in that box before, and you flash a green light on that rat, the rat won't behave any differently. The green means nothing to that rat. If you flash a red light in front of that rat, the rat won't do anything differently. It, means nothing to that rat. Now let's say you train the rat to press a bar, and every time it presses a bar, it gets food. The rat will go into the cage and start pressing the bar right away. Now let's say you set it up so that when the green light's on and the rat presses the bar, the rat gets food. If the red light's on and the rat presses the bar, the rat doesn't get food. And you do that over and over again. And then a couple of days later, you put the rat in the cage and you flip a red light on. The rat's gonna stop pressing, the, he won't press the bar. You put a green light on, the rat will press the bar. Now, why did the rat learn to press the bar when the green or red light's on? Well, because it's associated with a history of, of reinforcement or not getting reinforcement. So if ticks can be suppressed through reinforcement, then it stands to reason that situations that tell the person that reinforcement for suppression is available should make the ticks happen less. And situations that tell the, the child that reinforcement for suppression isn't available should make the ticks happen more, if that makes sense. So we tested that in this study, the next study, asking the question, can the environment develop stimulus control over ticks? Now, remember one of the key features of ticks is that there's a tremendous environmental fluctuation. 
Certain situations, ticks flare up. Certain situations, ticks flare down. Nobody's ever understood why that happens. Nobody's ever kind of figured out, like, why, why is that? Going from one environment to another, ticks can be so varied. I think this is one explanation. And here's the example. We had 10 kids with Tourette's and chronic tick disorders. This was published in Behavior Research and Therapy uh, a couple years ago. The kids came in and they had four training sessions. In each of the training sessions, we had a couple different conditions. Uh, one, they, had a, they sat in front of the tick detector and a purple light would come on. When the purple light was on, they were instructed to suppress their ticks, and every 10 seconds they went without a tick, they got a token. The other condition, the light was off, and they were told, tick freely if you have to. No, no reinforcement coming. Okay. We replicated each five-minute condition three times each of the four days. So they got 12 uh, uh, replications of the purple light, 12 replications of the no light condition. Now, you have to trust me in that there's nothing about purple that makes people tick more or less. Okay, there's nothing inherent in the color purple that makes ticks differ. Okay? So that's kind of a, a baseline assumption. On the fifth day, they came in. They were given no instructions. They were given no tokens. They were given nothing. They just simply sat in front of the box, and lights came on or off. Right? So sometimes a purple light would come on for a few minutes, then it would shut off. And then purple light would come on for a few minutes, and then it would shut off. And we were measuring what would happen in the presence of purple or in the presence of nothing. All right? So here's what we found. This is day one, or the, the summary of the first four days. As you'd expect, when they were reinforced for suppression, the purple light was on, the ticks were much lower than when they weren't reinforced for suppression, when the lights were off. All right? Four ticks a minute down to one and a half ticks a minute. Significant difference. That's not the interesting question because we knew that could happen. The question is what happens on day five when we don't tell them anything. We just flip the lights on and off. We don't give them any consequences when the lights are on or off. What happens then? Well, essentially the same thing. Uh, there's a significant difference between baseline and purple. So when the purple light came on, their ticks started to drop. When you turn the purple light off, their ticks would start to increase. And you could watch it happen. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't surprising. You'd, purple light would pop on, you'd see the kid's ticks start to slow down. Purple light would come off and the ticks would start to flare up again. And so it was a very obvious effect when it, when it would occur. And so that really gives us some evidence that the stimulus control hypothesis might actually be true. That the reason kids' ticks vary from situation to situation isn't anything inherent about the situation. It's that that situation predicts the availability of reinforcers for the suppression behavior that they have. So why is it that kids go to school and don't have many ticks at school often compared to home? Well, one of the reasons might be that at school, there's a lot of reinforcers for suppressing their ticks. At home, there aren't any. You know, the parents don't really care often whether the ticks are happening. It's not, there's not a lot of that social reinforcer there for suppression. And so you start to see variations in, in ticks according to the environment. Another study we looked at was the effects of stress on ticks. Now, there's this common belief in the Tourette's literature that stress makes ticks worse. And there really are no good experimental studies to show that. Um, they've just not been done. It's always been assumed that ticks have been worse. And, and the way it's been assumed is parent, or patients have reported, stress makes my ticks worse. Or parents have noticed that when their kid gets anxious, their ticks get worse. But we all, at least the psychologists, learn to trust, mistrust self-report in some ways because we know it's subject to a lot of different biases. There have been a cut. One study looked at thermal stress, so increasing the temperature on a child can actually make ticks a little worse. But other than that, there's not much uh, in terms of looking at stress and making ticks worse. We studied this and actually just got this accepted at Behavior Research and Therapy, um, looking at the effects of stress. We wanted to look at a couple different things. We wanted to look at the first question we wanted to ask was, does stress in general make ticks worse? You know, just is stress a tick generating kind of thing? And the second question is, does stress change your ability to suppress your ticks? All right, so we had kind of looked at two different things. We had 10 children, uh, different conditions, baseline, they were instructed not to suppress, let their ticks happen, and there was no stress. Another condition where we reinforced suppression every 10 seconds, they went without a tick, they got a token. Um, we also looked at st suppression, uh, a stress condition only, where they did age-appropriate, although challenging, timed math tests for the children. All right, so we tested out their age appropriateness for math. We asked them to do math tests and really timed it out, and that was our stress induction. Common type of stress induction used in psychological experiments. 
Uh, suppression and stress was another condition. In this condition, they were asked to suppress their tics, rewarded for doing so, and asked to do the time math test at the same time. Each condition was five minutes. Each was replicated twice. We counted tics and premonitory urge experience rated on a zero to eight scale. Don't pay much attention to the premonitory urge data. I don't think they're very good because of the way we measured it. We measured it as a, as a uh, and mass rating at the end of the condition, which I don't think was the best way to do it. So sort of ignore that if you can. Um, it conflicts with some later data that I'll talk about, and I think that's the reason why. Okay, so in the bars here, this is the first, the, the bars are the ticks. You can see baseline, suppression, okay, and that's a significant difference. So the kids were able to suppress their ticks like they have in all the other studies. Then you've got suppression plus stress, Right? And then you've got stress. So looking at the first question, does stress make, make ticks worse? No. When we induced stress in these children, their ticks did not get worse above baseline. They were equal to baseline. Okay, that's the first, first point. The second question is, what does stress do to the ability to suppress ticks? And the answer is, it decreases your ability to suppress ticks. When you're stressed, you can't suppress your ticks as well. So here's the question. Why is it that so many people report stress making their tics worse? I would argue that one plausible explanation is that stress really doesn't make tics worse. But what stress does is make your ability to stop your tics worse. And when you're stressed, you're usually in situations where you need to stop your tics for some reason. And, it, and you're trying to struggle with stopping your tics, but you can't because you're stressed, and it makes it feel like the tics are happening much, much more frequently than they actually are. That's my, my example for why, uh, my understanding of why this, this you keep, might get, get this report that stress makes tics worse. What this tells us clinically is that we might uh, want to think about using stress, uh, uh, coping with stress strategies in conjunction with treatment. Uh, that might be with treatment for behavior therapy. That, that actually probably could be very helpful. The last study I'll talk about in terms of experimental psychopathology is uh, evidence for the negative reinforcement hypothesis. In this study, we had five children with Tourette's. They ranged in age from 8 to 17. We used an ABAB withdrawal design. Now, you can't really test this directly because it's all internally contained. We, we have to make some assumptions. And our assumption is this. If the removal of the urge reinforces ticks, so if that's the case, if ticks really take away an urge, then when ticks are stopped, the urge should go up. When ticks are allowed to occur, the urge should go down. That's our hypothesis. All right. So we asked people to suppress their ticks and then had a period right after they suppressed letting them tick freely. And, and we measured ticks and urge the entire time to see what was happening. So I'm, I'm reporting these data chronologically backward. We had eight to 17 year olds. And I'm starting with a 17 year old and I'm working down. And I'm doing that for a reason. Now there's some evidence in the literature, there's some suggestion in the literature that the premonitory urge that children with Tourette's have doesn't show up until the around, around the age of 10. Okay, that's, that's the hypothesis that's, that's been suggested. I actually don't think that's true. I think it's often there before the age of 10. I just don't think children have a, a language to describe the urge. And I want, but I want, you to, and I, I want you to watch these data because the data get pretty clear. The bars are the ticks. The black line is the urge rating, the zero to eight urge rating that was uh, got, uh, received every 30 seconds, I think, throughout the study and then aggregated, maybe every minute. Not exactly, I'm not remembering. Um, in any case, allowed to tick freely at baseline, Ticks were high, urge was low, urge is over here. When we reinforced suppression, the ticks dropped dramatically and the urge spiked. When we, re when we allowed the ticks to occur freely, the urge dropped and the ticks spiked. When we reinforced suppression, the urge spiked and the ticks dropped. When we allowed ticks to occur freely, the urge dropped and the ticks spiked. Exactly what we would predict if this negative reinforcement hypothesis were true. The 14 year old, same thing. Ticks up, urge down. Ticks down, urge up. And that keeps going, that sawtooth pattern. Now his urge was always a little bit lower, but it was still that relative pattern. The 13-year-old, his urge was always relatively high, 
But the same pattern showed up. When he was suppressing, his urge went up. When his ticks were occurring freely, his urge went down, relatively speaking. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Now, there's another confound because we turn from males to females, but there's not much we can do about that. This is the 10-year-old. Okay. The 10-year-old could clearly suppress ticks. I mean, there was a the clear suppression effect, mild, but there. And there was an urge, a low-level urge the whole time, but the urge didn't really have anything to do with the ticks. It didn't functionally uh, go with the ticks. Now you look at the 8-year-old. Couldn't suppress, really, and didn't have much of an urge at all. So you start to see it, what almost looks like it happens is as, the, as children get older, this functional relationship between the urge and the ticks emerges, which is interesting. And, and that's something else we found in another study, too, where we looked at premonitory, we developed a premonitory urge measure, and we looked at children under the age of 10 and over the age of 10. And under the age of 10, the premonitory urge measure really didn't correlate much at all with tick severity in children. They had an urge, but it was not very well formed and it wasn't correlating much with tick severity. By the time the children got to age 10, their urges were just as strong and their urges were correlated with tick severity at that point. So it's like the urge might always sort of be there but not well formed, but as the disorder progresses, this urge becomes more functionally linked to the ticks, uh, which is an interesting idea. How do, what do we do with behavioral treatment formation? Well, what we have to appreciate is that the person's internal, inside their skin, and external environment can make the tick symptoms worse than they need to be. They can influence the tick symptoms. Second, we have to understand that the effects of the fact, these factors are unique to the individual. Everybody's going to be affected differently by these experiences. And to develop a useful treatment, we really need to address both the external and the internal contingencies in a way that's somewhat sensitive to the, the unique impact of those factors on the child. How do we do that? Well, we do uh, manage the external environment through a process called functional assessment and function-based intervention. In functional assessment and function-based intervention, our purpose, what we're trying to accomplish, is to identify factors that make the tics worse for a particular child, worse than usual for a particular child. And then what we do is once we've identified those factors, we develop treatment strategies that are targeted towards reducing the effects of those environmental factors on the child's tics. So for example, if we were working with a family, we would say, uh, sit, we would sit down with the mother and the son or the father and the son, the parents and the son, and we would say, I want you to tell me, when are your child's ticks worse than usual? Give me a typical example of a situation where your child's ticks are worse than usual. And they say, okay, well, here's an example. I come home every day, my son gets home from school and he's all stressed out and anxious and his ticks always get worse when he's anxious. He goes to the den to watch television right after he gets home from school so he can unwind, and his sister's down there watching TV, and he starts ticking really loudly because he has to get his ticks out at night, you know, right after school. And it just, it drives his sister crazy because he's so loud, she can't hear the TV, and you know, I'm upstairs getting dinner ready, and then his sister starts teasing him and yelling at him, and he starts crying because he's upset, and he doesn't like these ticks, and so I have to go downstairs and break it up. I get so mad at his sister because she's teasing him, and this poor kid can't help it, and I send her to her room, and then I sit down, and I comfort him, and I, you know, I give him a hug, and I tell him it's going to be okay, and, and so on and so forth, and then I go, you know, I tell him to get himself together and relax and watch TV, and we'll have a good rest of the night and then I go back up and finish dinner. That's four days a week for me, five days a week for me. That's every, every day. I swear. It drives me crazy. So as, a, as the therapist, we're sitting there listening. What are some potential antecedents that could be associated with his tics getting worse? Well, anxiety and stress might be making his tics worse. That's what they're saying. Um, Billy might be ticking more in, in the den, so in that television room. We find out through more information with mom that when he's outside after school, he doesn't tick very much. But when he's inside watching TV, he does tick a lot more. What's happening right after his tics that could be making the tics worse? His teasing sister is sent to the room, so he gets to see her get punished. That's not a bad thing for, for him. Um, Billy gets mom's love and attention. That's, that's pretty nice. He gets a good concentrated dose of mom time right there when he has a big burst of ticks. And he gets the TV to himself, so he doesn't have to watch what his sister is watching. He can watch what he wants to watch. That's not a bad thing either. Now, Billy's not doing this intentionally. Billy doesn't know that his ticks are changing his world that much. To Billy, it's just his day-to-day -day life. You know? But could those factors be influencing his ticks? Well, of course they could be. 
You know, he doesn't have to be aware of anything for those ticks to be influenced that way. So what we're doing is trying to identify those factors and then developing small strategies that the family can implement to try to bring those ticks down. So for example, if we think Billy's ticks are being made worse or uh, increased when he's anxious or stressed, we teach him relaxation strategies to use when he's stressed. Instead of having him go to the den after school every day, we'll change his daily routine. We'll have him go outside for a while after he gets home or go to the park after he gets home or something like that. Or maybe help out in the kitchen after he gets home. Something different that he can do that will keep him a little bit more active than just sitting in the den where his ticks are most likely to flare up. Instead of having the teasing sister sent to the room, we'll try to bring the sister in and make her part of treatment. Uh, and we'll ask her to stay in the room when she starts to tease him and, and apologize rather than, than be sent away. Instead of mom comforting Billy when he has a big burst of ticks, we teach her to ignore the burst of ticks when they're happening and talk to him about, him, about them and, and make sure he's okay at times when his ticks are actually fairly quiet. And then instead of Billy getting the TV to himself, we just turn the TV off or limit, amount, limit the amount of time and maybe that's when we have our behavior therapy homework time at a time when he's most likely to do his ticks. Okay. Now how do we deal with this internal environment? This is another, fa another piece that actually gets kind of tough. Uh, ideally, what we'd want to do is have the urge happen, let the tick occur, and then not provide relief. That's the best way to get rid of this situation. Unfortunately, that's almost impossible to do. We, we don't know how to do that. So what we have to do is let the urge occur, teach the child to block the tick from happening, and then hope that the urge will disappear on its own, that the, the, well, the person will habituate to the urge. It'll start to fade away by itself. All right? And fortunately, that's actually what happens in a lot of cases with Tourette's. If they give it enough time and enough practice, the urge to do the tick will fade away faster and faster and faster. So they notice the urge, they block it, and then the urge fades away. They do that again and again and again, and very soon the urge to do this will fade away faster and faster and faster until it becomes like, oh, there it is, and then it goes away. Oh, there it is, and then it goes away. Now, how do we do that? We do that through a process called habit reversal training. It probably does two things. It probably allows the uh, habituation process to take place, and it also probably floods the basal ganglia with another, a separate motor pattern that will disrupt the tick sequence. What is habit reversal? Habit reversal is an older treatment. It was created about 40 years ago by a psychologist named Nathan Azrin and his associate Greg Nunn in 1973. It's an old behavioral procedure that's been used to treat ticks, trichotillomania, skin picking, nail biting, thumb sucking, stuttering, bruxism. I mean, go on and on. Any kind of repetitive behavior uh, that, that people do, habit reversal has been used to treat. It has three primary components, awareness training, competing response training, and social support. In awareness training, uh, the purpose of it is to teach a person to become a more aware of when their ticks are happening. And usually habit reversal is done one tick at a time. So you do awareness training, competing response training, and social support training for one tick at a time. Uh, teach the child to become more aware of the tick and when it's happening and more aware of the urge to do the tick. And when they become more aware of the tick, then they're encouraged to do a competing response or behavior that physically prevents the tick from happening. They're asked to do that competing response any time of day when they A, notice the tick is about to occur, so they have that urge, or B, notice that the tick has already happened. All right? And they're asked to do that competing response for one minute or until that urge goes away, whichever's longer, whenever they notice that it's about to happen or is actually happening. There's also a social support component where the child with Tourette's has a parent usually, sometimes a teacher, and that parent or teacher reminds the child to use the exercise uh, by telling the child if they see the child do the tick but not use the exercise, they ask the child, hey, don't forget your exercise. They say, don't forget your exercise to the child. The child's prompted to use the competing response. Likewise, the support person is asked to praise the child if they see the child doing the competing response correctly. Now, does habit reversal work? Most of the literature that's been done on behavior therapy for Tourette's is just done on habit reversal. Uh, and habit reversal, since it's been around for 40 years, actually has a pretty long, heavy body of research behind it. It's been studied for over 30 years. It's considered a well-established intervention for ticks, according to APA Division 12. However, um, the sample sizes have been rel relatively small, and most of the work has been done on adults with Tourette's, not children with Tourette's. Um, almost all the studies that have been done uh, with the exception of one, have shown that habit reversal has beat, 
wait list, it's beat supportive therapy controls, and it's beaten other behavioral treatments. The one exception is a study out of the Netherlands that compared habit reversal to a treatment called exposure and response prevention, like you would use for OCD. That study actually showed equivalence in, in the findings, so both treatments were equally effective. You could argue that's because they share similar mechanisms, allowing habituation to this kind of uncomfortable internal experience is the, the, the mechanism behind both treatments. However, the, there's a confound in that the exposure and response prevention arm of that study actually received twice as much treatment time as the habit reversal session. They used the same number of sessions, but the ERP sessions were twice as long. They were two hours rather than one. So there's a little bit of a confound there in, in that they got double the dose in the ERP condition. So we can't say for sure whether they actually are equivalent, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were. We did a study to really answer the question of does a, uh, uh, habit reversal and actually a, a broader treatment that we developed called comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics, CBIT, does that work for children with tic disorder? And what we did, we had si uh, six sites that were involved. Three were data collection sites, and that would be the top three sites. And then three were support sites, which would be the bottom three sites. We actually did another study where we treated adults with Tourette's, and the bottom three sites became uh, uh, the recruitment sites for the adult study. And in this study, we had 126 children ages 9 to 17 with Tourette's and chronic tic disorder who received either the comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics or a psychoeducation and supportive therapy control condition. The, both conditions received eight sessions of treatment over 10 weeks, two 90-minute sessions at the beginning, and then re the remaining six sessions that were one hour apiece. Right. The CBIT condition included uh, psychoeducation about tics, habit reversal therapy, function-based interventions that I had talked about earlier, a reward system to enhance compliance with treatment and relaxation training to be used in targeted ways uh, when the child was stressed. The other condition involved psychoeducation and supportive therapy. It, it, the psychoeducation topics that were discussed and were involving those following topics. Now, the children were assessed at baseline, that's week zero, midpoint, week five, and then endpoint, week 10. They were assessed by a blinded independent evaluator, a person who didn't know what condition the child was actually in. And then at the end of week 10, they were classified as either treatment responders or non-responders. The responders were people who got meaningful clinical benefit out of this treatment, people who got better, like noticeably better. And they, they were defined as having a clinical global impression scale score of one or two, very much improved from baseline or much improved from baseline at the end of treatment at week 10. Treatment responders then received once a month booster sessions in the treatment arm that they had been assigned to. Then they were reassessed at week 23, which is a three month follow up, and at week 36, which is the six month follow up. Non responders weren't followed. Eligibility, the kids were 9 to 17, had to have a chronic tic disorder or Tourette's diagnosis of a certain severity. They could be medicated on Tourette, medications for tics or unmedicated, but if they were medicated for their tic uh, condition, they had to be on a stable dose for at least six weeks and had to have no changes during the treatment. Uh, the, if they had very severe Tourette's, they were initially excluded until they could be informed of other potential treatment options, and then if they still wanted to come into the study, they were allowed in. Uh, if their IQ was under 80, they were ruled out. If they had uh, drug use, uh, substance abuse uh, currently, or a, a chemical dependency in the past three months, they were out. If they had pervasive developmental disorder, mania, or psychotic disorder, they were excluded. And if they had any other psychiatric disorder that really um, needed treatment above before the Tourette's needed to be addressed, then they were sent for that. They weren't, they weren't enrolled right away. Primary outcome measures, three primary outcome measures, the CGI improvement scale, one to seven scale, looking at uh, uh, improvement over time from baseline. Total tick score, which is a zero to 50 point, uh, on the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale, zero to 50 point scale, zero meaning very not severe, very mild, almost no ticks, 50 meaning extraordinarily severe ticks. And then the YGTS sense of impairment score, which is a measure of impairment related to Tourette's or impairment caused by ticks, zero to 50 point scale. This is the consort diagram. 
couple of just highlights here. You can see we had 177 that were consented and screened, and we actually randomized 126. Um, 39 were ineligible for one reason or another. 61 were assigned to CBIT, 65 to supportive therapy, and about 10% dropout rate during the study, which is actually very low. Some Haldol studies will report 80% dropout rate, meaning that people didn't like the treatment enough, they just, kept, they just stopped coming. All right. So dropout rate is one proxy measure for treatment acceptability. A 10% dropout rate suggests fairly acceptable treatment. And we won't worry about the long-term outcome uh, flow at this point. Sample characteristics, mean age of about 12, mostly male, average IQ, 40% roughly were on tick-reducing meds when they came into the study, and the family structure was fairly stable. Most kids had Tourette's diagnoses. The most common comorbidity was ADHD, although you'd see it a little bit lower than you've seen reported in other studies. I'm not sure why this is the case, but I have some hypotheses that this might be a little bit on the lower end of normal, but within a normal range when you consider the methodological issues. OCD was actually, again, fairly common, much higher than you'd see in a normal, uh, normal population. Um, one thing we were surprised by was the higher level of anxiety disorders in this, this population, particularly social, social anxiety. This is, the, this is what it looks like at the end of treatment. Following 10 weeks of behavior therapy uh, for children with Tourette's, 53% uh, of the sample were classified as treatment responders. That means CGI of much improved or very much improved versus 19% of the supportive therapy condition. In this case, for children, medication status did not moderate outcome, although it was close with data trending toward meds predicting poorer response to behavior therapy. Meds for ticks predicting poorer response to behavior therapy. Tick severity was decreased from baseline for CBIT relative to supportive therapy. Uh, Tick-related impairment was decreased for CBIT relative to supportive therapy from baseline. And when we look at maintenance data, we ask the question of how many people who had responded at the end of treatment were still responders at three months and six months after treatment ended. And here's what these data say. The, the light blue is the CBIT, the green is PST. And, and PST really showed a similar response. If you got better on PST, supportive therapy and psychoeducation, you stayed better, okay? It wasn't, wasn't lost. The problem was that very few people responded to supportive therapy in the first place. So that, that's the big issue. But when we look at CBIT, if you were 86% of the people who were responders at the end of treatment were still responders three months later. 87% of people who were responders at the end of treatment were still responders six months later. Now, these are the people we were able to find. Obviously, if you... Uh, and, and we found the majority of them um, that came back. The, the people who didn't come back, you could classify them as non-responders. You could classify them as responders. We're not sure how to, how to put that. Um, so we, we looked just at our completers here. Now, there's some other things we looked at in this study. We looked at the effects uh, of treatment. Well, not really. We looked at associations between uh, response status and performance on other symptom measures. So we, we, in, in behavior therapy literature, in Tourette's, you hear criticisms of behavior therapy for Tourette's saying things like, you know, if you, if you teach a kid to suppress their tics, it's just gonna increase other problems. They're gonna get more disruptive, they're gonna get more nervous and anxious, they're gonna get more stressed, they're gonna get, um, you know, all kinds of other issues. So we actually looked at that. We gave a number of other symptom measures to examine whether or not other symptom clusters changed over time. And what we found is, in people who responded to CBIT, people who actually, whose ticks decreased as a function of this treatment, on the CBCL total problem scale, six months later, you actually see a decrease in total problems. So in kids who responded to behavior therapy for Tourette's, all of their problem behaviors just decreased six months later, all right? Their anxiety, six months later, was down significantly from baseline. And these are in kids who responded to treatment for ticks. Now, we can't say that our treatment did this. All we can say is that it doesn't make it worse, all right? Disruptive behavior is lower six months later in kids who responded to treatment. Okay. So all the other symptom clusters that we were looking at also improved in kids who responded to treatment. If their tics got better, other things got better later. 
which is, is a nice thing. It didn't, the, the improvement in those other symptoms didn't happen at the end of treatment. They happened six months later, which suggests possibly that reducing the symptoms initially actually might have downstream benefits in other areas of their life, which is, is how you could interpret this, but you'd have to be careful doing so. Now, how does CBIT compare to other treatments like the atypical antipsychotics? Well, looking at the CBIT study, compared to a couple of drug studies that have been done using very similar methodologies and that are used to support uh, the use of atypical antipsychotics for the treatment of Tourette's, uh, we can see that our sample size in CBIT was a much larger study than many of the other drug trials that are done. You know, these are pretty typical of, of tick, tick drug studies in terms of sample size. You can see that our reduction that we saw on the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale for our active treatment was very similar to what you find in risperidone and zeprazidone in terms of symptom reduction on that measure. And you can see that our control treatment was actually a little stronger in terms of symptom reduction than pill placebo conditions. And our effect sizes were a little bit lower than risperidone or zeprazidone, but a lot of that was probably brought on by the fact that our control condition was actually more powerful, which would reduce our effect size. So essentially, from looking at these data, what you can say is CBIT produces tick reductions roughly in the range of atypical antipsychotics, which would put it at about a level two of your treatment pre-sequencing. Uh, you usually start with clonidine guanfacine and you go up to atypicals. And then we're kind of in that range in terms of what, we're, what this treatment produces. Adverse events, we looked at adverse events week to week to see if this treatment was causing any other you know, untoward side effects. And what we found is that only two side effects show differentiation between conditions, and it was accidental injury and stomach discomfort, both of which were happening more frequently in supportive therapy. Okay. Now, we have no reason to believe that supportive therapy actually causes you to be clumsy or actually causes you to have stomach discomfort. So really, what's the explanation for that? The explanation is statistical error. When you run this many, uh, this many t statistical tests and you don't correct for family-wise error rate, your error rate will inflate, and this is a complete accident. If we had controlled for these statistically using Bonfroni corrections or something like that, th these wouldn't be different. We looked at a couple other things as side effects happening on a, on a week to week basis. Were these kids who were being taught to stop their ticks, manage their ticks, were they getting more anxious or nervous than the group that wasn't being taught those skills? Nope. Were they being more disruptive? No. Were their ticks actually getting worse because they were becoming more aware of their ticks and so on? No. Were they getting tired and fatigued because of this, and this is a, supposed to be a very tiring, fatiguing treatment, and the answer is no. These aren't happening. These, these things aren't happening week to week. Okay. So summarizing. CBIT is more efficacious than supportive therapy for reducing tick severity and reducing tick-related impairment. It's roughly similar to atypical antipsychotics for reducing symptoms. It has a lower uh, effect size, but it's probably because of a use of an active comparison group. And it's got a, CBIT has a more favorable safety profile. In addition, the people who respond to behavior therapy for Tourette's maintain these gains and improve in other areas of functioning six months after treatment. So essentially what we have here is a treatment that is as effective as atypical antipsychotics without the side effects whose treatment uh, benefits gain and, and may even extend into other areas of symptom functioning. So that, that's the intervention. Now, if behavior therapy is so promising, why is it not out there more? I think there are a couple problems. One is dissemination. We need to figure out good ways and the best ways of training people how to do this. And this is true for all of behavior therapy. We don't know empirically the best way to train behavior therapy. Uh, the, the, the science hasn't caught up to us on that. You know, do we need to have follow-up supervision? Is that necessary? If so, how much? Is a workshop enough for somebody who's trained in behavioral principles? We don't know. Um, so there are a lot of things we don't know about getting these treatments out to people. Um, we also have a referral problem. And the referral problem is that most behavior therapists don't know how to treat this and most uh, neurologists and pediatricians who are the first to get these cases don't know that this stuff exists. So if most pe neurologists, pediatricians, psychiatrists are the ones who see these cases first and they don't know we exist, then there's gonna be a referral problem. 
And so we've really got to do a lot of front end work about educating the pediat pediatricians, the neurologists, and the psychiatrists that behavior therapy for Tourette's is a viable option. And at the same time, we've got to make sure we actually have somebody that they can refer people to. Uh, we need to have behavior therapists that are trained up to do this kind of thing. There's also a concern about the beliefs about the negative effects of behavior therapy that still linger in the popular press uh, in, Tourette's, in the Tourette's world and among some medical professionals. In, in neurology, there's a group of neurologists who really don't like this, this idea. They think it's, it's, it's not very useful. They think, in fact, there's writing about it could potentially be more harmful than good. And there are a few different beliefs that inhibit the use of behavior therapy that you see pop up in writings. Uh, hopefully we've just debunked some of these, but you still hear these flare up as both, as both concerns expressed by professionals and as concerns expressed by parents. The first one that you hear is this idea of rebound effects. The idea of rebound effects is that when you try to stop your tics, it ultimately just makes them worse than if you had never tried to stop them. So essentially the idea is you're, you're keeping these tics in and that energy that's built up has to get out somewhere. And when you stop the inhibition, when you stop suppressing, the burst of tics that's going to come from that energy is just like a nuclear warhead being released. It's, you know, boom, the tics explode. Okay. The second uh, uh, belief is that there's this idea of symptom substitution, and this is as old as behavior therapy itself. In other words, if you're trying, if you stop one tick, it actually just makes other ticks worse. Okay? So really, what behavior therapy for Tourette's does is just push ticks around. You stop one, and then you're making a new one come out. That kind of thing. And the third criticism is that the ability to attend to other things will be greatly diminished when you're trying to do behavior therapy for ticks because all of your cognitive focus is going to be on suppressing your ticks. You couldn't possibly attend to anything else, like a teacher, for example. So we looked at the, these, these questions empirically. The first question of, is there a rebound effect? We had seven children with Tourette's, and they had three conditions, back to the tick detector. Baseline condition, reinforced suppression condition, and a rebound evaluation condition. In baseline, they were told to tick freely, five-minute conditions, and when they did, they were ticking about 50% of the 10-second intervals. When they were reinforced for suppression, every 10 seconds they go without a tick, they get a token, their ticks dropped to about 15% of the intervals. Then we took away the reinforcement and told them to tick freely again. Now, if the rebound hypothesis is true, then right after a period of successful suppression, their ticks should go beyond baseline. They should expand beyond baseline if suppression has a toxic effect on tick frequency. But it doesn't. It doesn't even return to baseline. And then when you suppress again, replicate it, their ticks are able to go down again. And then look at what happens after the, the suppression is stopped. It doesn't go back up to baseline again. So again, in this study, it doesn't look like suppression has a toxic effect. However, to be fair, these are only five-minute conditions. So what happens when you ask them to suppress for longer periods of time? Well, you could have two hypotheses. One is that the longer kids suppress, they, the worse they get at it. Because the, the suppression is a, the hypothesis would be the suppression is a fatiguing thing and it will make, it wear them out and eventually their ability to suppress will just wear out. That's the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that the longer you suppress, the more that energy builds up and then you've got the more likely you're going to see an explosion right after it. So we tested that in another study. Uh, 10, 13 children with Tourette's. Uh, baseline, they were taking eight and a half ticks a minute. And what we did here, was we asked each of the 13 children to suppress for five minutes, followed by a five-minute rebound, 25 minutes, followed by a five-minute rebound evaluation period, and 40 minutes, followed by a five-minute rebound evaluation period. Now, the order in which they got these durations of suppression was varied for each child. So some people suppress 40 minutes first, some people suppress 25 minutes first, some people suppress five minutes first, so on and so forth. So the first five minutes, they dropped from eight and a half ticks a minute to two ticks a minute during suppression. Rebound evaluation when they were told to tick freely right after five minutes of suppression, their ticks went up a little bit, but not statistically past baseline. So there was no statistical difference there. 25 minutes of suppression, you think, oh, okay, they're starting to get a little worse. They're suppressing longer, so their ticks are getting a little worse. What happens after 25 consecutive minutes of suppression? Well, the rebound actually goes back down, it starts to drop a little bit. They don't rebound, and, and they go back down, starting to go down below baseline. 40 consecutive minutes of suppression, you'd expect suppression 
to really fall apart at this point because it's so long, and you'd expect rebound to spike, but it doesn't happen. In fact, suppression goes back down to just about the level five minutes was at, and rebound after five, 40 minutes was down a little bit even lower than 25 minutes and was actually trending towards being lower than baseline at that point. So what it really tells us is that even up to 40 consecutive minutes of suppression, you don't get a, a rebound effect. It, just, it doesn't happen. And other studies have looked at this too, and nobody's ever been able to document a rebound effect, broadly speaking. Is it to say that it couldn't happen in one child here or there? No, of course it could. But as a general principle, it doesn't seem to happen. What about the symptom substitution idea? To study this, we had five kids with Tourette's and a multiple baseline across subjects design. All of our data were collected from in-home recordings. And we, we had kids with Tourette's, so they had motor and vocal tics. And in this study, we only treated vocal tics. We didn't treat motor tics. We did that intentionally because our hypothesis was that if symptom substitu substitution was true, then as we reduced the vocal tics, the motor tics should increase. All right. So we did this in one one-hour treatment session. We treated all vocal tics in one one-hour session and then had two half-hour booster sessions. And we did one session per week, per week for three weeks. Now you can see each panel is a different child. Each dot, each data point is an in-home recording. The da dark lines are vocal tics, and those are the tics we actually treated. And the dashed lines are motor tics. Those are the tics we didn't treat. The vertical dash line is the day that treatment session was done, the one hour session. And then there's a three month follow up period out here. You can see for Don, vocal tics significantly decreased after treatment, maintained at three month follow up, significant reduction in motor tics, even though they weren't targeted for treatment. John, significant reduction in vocal tics, no change in motor tics, relapse at three months. Ben, significant change in vocal tics, no change in motor tics maintenance at three months. Raul, reduction in vocal tics, no change in motor tics, maintenance at three months. Frank had no effective treatment. So in summary, what this tells us is that uh, the, treat, the tics that were targeted for treatment were reduced, and actually they were reduced about 83% from baseline. The tics that weren't targeted for treatment didn't increase, but rather decreased, and they were reduced about 19% from baseline or no, 23%, sorry, 23% from baseline. So really what we found was that this symptom substitution idea doesn't hold water. Untreated ticks don't get worse. If anything, they get better. Most often they'll do nothing, but if anything, they'll get better, if, they, if any change. Now the last belief out there that has been used to criticize behavior therapy for Tourette's is this one. Uh, the, the idea that trying to suppress your tics and do something else cognitively demanding can't be done. All right. So to test this, we had nine kids with Tourette's. This was actually just published last year in Behavior Research and Therapy. We had nine children with Tourette's. Um, we had them exposed to three conditions. A baseline condition, feel free to tick if you need to. A suppression condition, every 10 seconds you go without a tick, you get a token. And then a suppression plus distraction condition. All right. And the distraction condition was actually a, a modified version of a continuous performance test. Right? So it was they had to watch these letters come up on a screen and, and say when certain letters had shown up and, and so on. It was like a modified CPT that was only done verbally because we didn't want them to use their hands. And we were looking at their tics. Um, it kind of interfered with a little bit of vocal tics, but there's not much we can do about that. Um, so what we found in this study was that when... <laughs> Uh, children were asked to suppress their tics and reinforced for doing so. They could do that. And when they were distracted while suppressing, so they were using this continuous performance test while they were suppressing their tics, they were still able to suppress their tics. All right? So while the distraction was on, their tics were still a lot lower than baseline when they were still suppressing. And there was no difference between suppression and suppression plus distraction. However, there's a converse to that. I mean, you could have a child who's able to suppress their tics while doing a distracting task. They're just not doing very well on the distracting task. I mean, that's the, uh, the converse of it. So we wanted to ask that question. Does stopping the tics actually impact your ability to, to pay attention to this? And what we did find is that from the baseline performance on the CPT that we did before the study even started, uh, there, was a, there was an effect of distraction. So while the child was suppressing, their accuracy on the CPT dropped by about 11%. All 
All right. Now, you could say, oh, my God, there's a significant difference there. I would argue that 11% decrease on this on accuracy actually isn't that big, you know, compared to what you're doing. You know, so if somebody were poking you in the back um, while you were doing your CPT, you'd probably have a greater decrease than 11%, for example. Or if a child were sitting there talking to you in class while you were doing this, this continuous performance distracting ta distraction task, you'd probably do worse than 11% decrease. And so I, I would argue that 11% may or may not mean too much here. I, I'm thinking it probably doesn't. And I would also argue that this is, this is the first time this child is doing this task. So I'd want to know how the child does in terms of this distraction task when they've been practicing suppression for three weeks. Do they get a lot better at it? My guess is they would. It wouldn't be as cognitively demanding. However, there does seem to be a little bit of truth to the, the idea that when you start learning to manage your tics like this, you could see a small impact on ability to attend to other things. I think that's a perfectly legitimate, uh, legitimate thing to consider. Summarizing. HRT behavior therapy is a promising treatment for Tourette's. We still need predictors of response to treatment. Who does this work for? Who does this not work for? We need to understand mechanism of change data a little bit. So what's changing in the brain when this happens, when, when people get better? And we also need to overcome barriers to implementation. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is looking at telehealth service delivery, being able to deliver this treatment over teleconference equipment. Um, we've been looking at trying to uh, use therapists, uh, develop thera uh, computerized therapist training packages, and we've been doing a lot of work on educating care providers about the availability of behavior therapy. Uh, related to the telehealth service, uh, we, we've actually started to do a study. We published a study that came out uh, this year, I think, in cognitive behavioral practice. Maybe it was late last year, where we had three children with Tourette's that were sitting in North Dakota but treated by me in Milwaukee over teleconference equipment. And just to show you kind of what, you know, you've seen data from the other studies and just show you how these data look too. Um, this was, uh, every data point was an in-home observation that uh, we went out and collected from their homes. Uh, and you can see the vertical dash line is the day we started treatment. We used the CBIT manual. And you can see over time, Again, the same pattern. All three kids showed a reduction of ticks. Some were better than others, uh, but all three children showed reductions in ticks over time, and most maintained gains at the two at a two week follow up. So again, you know this is done from 800 miles away, and and it worked just as well as, as the other treatments do. So it does hold promise for reaching children in remote areas or, or underserved urban areas even. And so this is where we're taking our research next in a lot of ways is looking at the dissemination models, especially using technology to, to work with dissemination. So that really wraps up the, the talk right now so I can take